Greetings and welcome back to Chapter 5 or Newton's Third Law. I want to start today's lecture by posing a question. If I push on a wall, does it push back? Well, of course it does, because if it didn't, I would fall through the wall, the wall would fall over, the building would fall down on top of us, and uh, we would all have a very bad time. If I push really hard onto a wall, it, I can get I can push myself backwards, right? What does that mean? Well, the building has a certain amount of structural integrity, and just a simple push like that isn't going to push the building over, right? But that also means that the wall actually pushed back. And that means that the push force occurred as a pair of forces, right? I push, the wall pushes back. And if you don't believe me, what would happen if I tied a rope to the wall or the door or whatever and pulled on it? Well, would it be different? No, of course not. That's ridiculous, right? Why would it? <laughs> Obviously, these forces are equal in magnitude and opposite in direction, right? A pair of equal and opposite forces. Just like if two teams play tug-of-war and the rope goes taut, right? Obviously, if I tie a rope to the door and I pull on it, the rope is going to go taut, right? Cinched. <laughs> that means that the wall is actually pulling back. Pretty straightforward, right? Now, what if I took a piece of paper and I punched it? Does it punch back? Well, not so well, right? As a matter of fact, if you try to punch a piece of paper, just a single sheet of paper, it's not going to feel like much, right? You're not going to be able to deliver a lot of force to it. But if you punch a 300 pound punching bag, on the other hand, it's going to resist, right? That's an equal and opposite pair of forces. The tissue paper, however, can't offer the same amount of resistance as the punching bag, and therefore, you can't exert the same force on it. But is there any possible case where forces don't occur in equal and opposite pairs? What about gravity? If I drop this pen and gravity exerts a force on it, does the pen exert the same gravitational force on the Earth? What we're saying here, right? So here's our pen, right? And then here's the Earth. Obviously, the Earth is going to pull the pen down, but that means the pen should pull the Earth up, right? Is that possible? Can this possibly be? That's an equal and opposite pair of forces, right? <coughs> so, the Earth is going to exert a certain amount of gravitational force on the pen, but does the pen exert the same amount on the Earth? Well, of course it does. Forces always occur in pairs equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. But if that's true, then how come the Earth doesn't really, doesn't move, right? The pen moves, but the Earth doesn't move, right? Well, just like a car and the road pushing on each other, or a rocket expelling burning fuel, they always exert equal and opposite forces. We say forces occur in pairs, equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. And in the case of the pen and the Earth, <coughs> They may exert the same force on each other, but one may accelerate differently. Let's say that, you know, this has a mass of 0 0.1 kilograms. And if we're going to put it in Earth's gravitational field, it's going to accelerate at something like 9.81 meters per second squared, right? So that's like 9 point, or 0.98 newtons, right? Almost 1 newton. But if the force here is about one newton, if you apply a force of one newton to the Earth, how much is it going to accelerate? Well, the Earth has a mass of about 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. That's a lot. <laughs> and as a result of it being, you know, like a six with 24 zeros after it, if you apply a force of one newton to that, you're going to get something like 
10 to the minus minus 24 meters per second squared acceleration. Not a lot, right? Now let's drive the point home just a little bit here. Consider, if you will, a cannon, right? You got your cannon. These come on big old spoked wheels, right? So you have a cannon, <coughs> and the cannon is going to fire a cannonball, right? Now, <coughs> when the cannon is fired, the cannon is going to push the cannonball out, right? But the cannonball is going to push the cannon back. We call that recoil. So this is going to accelerate a little bit, but this is going to accelerate a lot more. How much does the cannon move? Eh, it'll move a little bit, right? That's why we put wheels on the cannon. So it can recoil a little. But the cannonball, because it weighs much, much less, or a better way to say that is it has much less mass than the cannon itself, the cannonball is going to accelerate a whole lot, which is why you can fire it, you know, a great distance, right? The cannonball has less mass, and so it accelerates more. This, of course, comes from Newton's second law of force equals mass times acceleration. So we have to be really careful about force pairs, right? Well, it is true that we're not accelerating to the core of the Earth because the pair of forces acting on us are gravity and the normal force. Gravity and the normal force are not a pair of forces, right? So if you're standing on the ground, obviously the two forces acting on you are your weight and the normal force. And they're equal in magnitude and opposite in direction. But these are not a pair of forces, right? The pair of forces here are <coughs> the normal force pushing on you and the normal force of you pushing on the ground. And <coughs> the force of gravity pulling you down and the your force of gravity pulling up on the Earth. That's a pair of forces, that's a pair of forces. These may be the pair of forces acting on you, but they are not an equally matched, equal pair of forces caused by the same phenomenon, right? These, the gravitational forces, are caused by the same phenomenon. The normal forces are caused by the same phenomenon, right? So just like friction, the normal force only comes into being when two surfaces come into contact, like the normal force. But why do we accelerate more down a steeper hill? Well, obviously because there's more force accelerating us down a steeper hill. <coughs> but why is that? Well, because more of the force is accelerating us or less is being taken up by the acceleration due to gravity. Hello, Lucky. Okay, you're standing in front of the camera. Okay, she went up to go eat. <coughs> okay, so if we have like this shallow grade here, we got the weight, right? There's going to be some component of the weight that is perpendicular, right? and that's going to be equal and opposite to the normal force. And there's going to be some component of the weight that is parallel to the surface. These two are the same force, right? I just moved it. But if it's really steep, here's the weight, right? And there's going to be just a little bit of a perpendicular component, and there's going to be a lot of a parallel component, right? Here's our normal force. It's going to be equal and opposite to the perpendicular component. And so if the hill is steeper, obviously more of the weight is going to push the object down and things are going to accelerate more down steeper hills. Makes a lot of sense, right? <coughs> now let us sidestep to consider a vector that is neither horizontal nor vertical, right? This one, for example. It has some component in the horizontal direction and some component in the vertical direction, right? Both are non-zero, but those two components add up to the vector itself, right? 
This is what we call the parallelogram method. So let's say you had some vector like this. It's going to have an x component and a y component. <coughs> now you add this component, the x component, to the y component by adding them tip to tail. You stick the vertical co component on the end of the horizontal component and that adds up to your total vector, right? This can actually work for any two vectors. Let's say you've got one vector like this and one vector like this. We'll call this one A and this one B. And if you wanted to add them together, you would just add them tip to tail. So we're going to put A here and we're going to put B here. So this is A plus B or B plus A. And this will give you your resultant vector here, A plus B. Anyway, we call that the parallelogram method. Now, let us consider for a moment the snow border, right? <coughs> so let's say you're standing on your snowboard, right? And as long as you're on even ground, <coughs> you have the weight and you have the normal force and they're equal and opposite and they cancel out to zero, right? But if the rider starts to go downhill, Obviously, we have the weight pushing down, right? <coughs> Where does the normal force point? Always perpendicular or normal to the surface that you're in contact with, right? So we're going to have this normal force component is going to cancel out with uh, this will be the weight perpendicular to the surface, right? these two are going to be equal in magnitude in opposite direction and cancel out. And we're going to be left with the weight parallel to the surface, right? Now, <coughs> how big is this angle? Would you believe me if I told you that the angle in between the weight itself and the perpendicular component was equal to the angle of incline? It's a funny thought, right? But let's run through a thought experiment here. <coughs> so if this is flat ground, right? And this is straight up and down. This is a 90 degree angle, right? They're vertical and horizontal, so they're perpendicular to each other. Okay, <coughs> now, Let's take this angle here, we'll call it theta prime. If you add up, look at this here, this is the weight. This vector downward is the weight. Now if you add up the three angles of a triangle, it always equals, anybody know? 180 degrees, right? Now, this is 90 degrees. Therefore, theta prime plus theta is equal to 90 degrees, right? Well, Theta plus theta prime is 90 degrees. Theta prime and theta is 90 degrees, right? This is the surface itself, right? Parallel to the surface, and this is perpendicular to the surface. So this is essentially a 90 degree angle also. So this and this have to equal 90 degrees. This and this have to equal 90 degrees. So this angle here, the, the angle in between the weight and the perpendicular component of the weight, right? The part of the weight that is going to be perpendicular to the surface, the one that's going to be equal and opposite to the normal force, is going to be separated from the weight by the same angle as the incline. Anyway, you are probably going to find that useful in uh, some of your upcoming homework problems, so make a note of that. <coughs> in any case, we could maybe say then that there is a component of the gravitational force that is perpendicular to the surface, right? that is canceled out by the normal force. And there is a component that is parallel to the surface that is going to cause acceleration. If friction was a part of this picture, which way would friction be acting? 
Well, the rider is going to be sliding downhill, right? So that means that friction is going to act uphill, trying to slow the rider down. Very quickly, I want you to have a look at figure 5.26 in the book <coughs> concerning ourselves with monkey Mo. Now, our situation is something like this. We have a mass, essentially, right? And we've got like one rope here and one rope here, right? Obviously, there's going to be tensions in each of these ropes. Tension is just a force in a rope. Don't worry about it. Now, what other, what other forces are also acting on the monkey? Well, obviously, weight, right? <clears throat> so, we can say that if this monkey is in equilibrium, that means if all the forces add up to zero, right? The monkey is standing there, or just kind of sitting there, not moving. That means if we took this force and decomposed it into its components, we'll call this, I don't know, T2X, and we'll call this component T2Y, you can very clearly see that this has to be equal to this for them to cancel out to zero, and this component has to cancel out with this component, right? Or the vertical component of tension two has got to be equal and opposite to gravity, and the horizontal component of tension two has to be equal and opposite to tension one. If you have any questions, of course, please email me, and I'll see you again soon for chapter six.